I'm a little tired of waiting for people to show up, so that's their problem. Um, what I'll start doing pretty soon, because I have all these sheets from uh, the stack from previous classes where uh, I've recorded attendance. Um, so I will actually enter those into uh, my labs plus so you can see where you stand now. I did forget on a few occasions, but. Um, oh, okay. So our grade on my labs plus is not considering our attendance. Right. Okay. But now you'll be, I'll all be documented. Um, so. And hopefully there isn't a situation where I say that somebody isn't there and then generally were, because I'm not sure how one would prove that. Um, okay. Um, even though we do have video, but. <laughs> um, okay. Saves the point six. All right. So picking up, we left off uh, last time about uh, changes of variable. So, um, to an example. Okay, actually, I have a couple examples of that. And then any time that's left over is for homework questions or questions on the practice test. If you start working with that. Um, um, so, the first example here is our double integral over some region R, which I'll define in a moment. And this is our integrand. Um, and R is an ellipse. Um, and the equation of the ellipse happens to be um, this integrand um, being equal to 2. So uh, changing the integrand is going to be uh, trivial, except we still have a Jacobi most of work on change the variables. Now, um, so what would be a, um, if we're going to take an integral over an ellipse, but we want to transform that by changing the variable into integral over a simple, sh simpler shape, what would be an appropriate simpler shape that's not too different from an ellipse? Yeah, a circle. Um, so here's what we can do. Um, so this is one of those where the change of variable is uh, given. Um, because normally, if it's not given, what you have to do is try to get the equation of the ellipse into a more standard uh, form um, so that you can readily see how to change it into a circle. So the change of variable will be square root of 2u. So here, here we have the old variables in terms of the new, which is going to be quite convenient for us. And I just want to emphasize, right, so u and v are not under the, uh, the square root in either case. And then this equation for y, square root of 2u plus square root of 2 thirds c. Um, so the integrand, this part of the integrand, is just going to become uh, 2. Um, no, it's not. Sorry. It's only equal to 2 on the boundary. Um, it would be equal to something else in the interior. Um, so um, what we need to do is um, we need to know what the limits will be in u and v. Now, in this case, we're never going to know the limits in x and y. We don't need that. Uh, we only need the limits on the integral we're actually going to evaluate. Um, is, is, are those given values, um, x and y? Oh, for, of, um, like for the limits, or? Yes. It, uh, well, what do you just put down there? X equals okay. square root. Yeah, yeah, so this is something that's given. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, now, um, if there's a problem where you're not given a change of variable, something where you're told transform this given region into this new one, and it'd be something that'd be presumably simpler, but you could uh, um, figure out what a change of variable is supposed to be. Um, so I think both cases will be given. Um, all right, so then we have, um, we have transforming integrand. And uh, what you can always do is, since you're given uh, the change of variable in this form, x equals something, y equals something, you can take these and substitute them into the integrand and figure out what that's going to be. Um, and then you have 
your extra factor, or now more properly called the Jacobian, which is the um, determinant, in this case a two by two, involving your partial derivatives of your old variables, x and y, with respect to your new variables, u and v. And since, again, there's change variables in this form, you can just go ahead and compute those partial derivatives. And uh, that will be difficult in this case because x and y are linear functions of uh, uh, u and v. OK. Now, um, so first, um, I'm actually going to uh, take this equation. Um, so in order to understand what the new domain is uh, in UV space, I'm going to change this equation to an equivalent one um, in terms of U and V. Uh, because once you do that, then that will give you an idea as to what kind of shape you're really dealing with and therefore what the limit should be for U and V. Um, so I go ahead and substitute. So X uh, will be square two u minus square two thirds v squared minus square two u minus square two thirds v square two u plus square two thirds v. So this is x squared minus x y um, plus y squared. equal to 2. Um, so this is y squared. Um, now, um, as you can imagine, the algebra is going to get pretty messy. Um, and actually, this part is not worked out in the notes. But just using the, your formulas for um, uh, squares of uh, a plus b, a minus b, you get a squared plus or minus 2ab plus b squared. So a lot of these square roots are going to go away, which is quite nice. Um, so you're going to get, in this case, 2u squared. Um, and then we have minus square 2, square 2, square 2 thirds, uv, plus 2 thirds v squared. So this is what x squared turns out to be in terms of u and v. And then this part, this is a situation where we have like a plus b times a minus b. So we, it's basically a squared minus b squared. So we get minus 2u squared minus 2 thirds u squared. Um, and then finally, um, this works out similarly to this, except with a uh, plus instead of a minus. So we have 2u squared plus 2 square 2 square 2 thirds uv plus 2 thirds v squared is all equal to uh, 2. Okay. Now, thankfully, a whole lot is going to simplify. Um, is there anything I can just get rid of? One of your two u squares cancel out. Mm -hmm. um, two of them. Yeah, well, uh, you have two better of a plus sign, one of a minus. So, so yeah, this and this will cancel out. Okay. The two, two square two, um, the whole mess. This mess? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it appears twice the opposite sign. So, thankfully, those go away. So, um, <laughs> and now. Um, Okay. Hold on. How did those disappear? Wouldn't it be negative plus a negative? No, because they both have a plus in initially. Minus oh, it's not in parentheses. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was looking for negative. Okay. Um, oh, and you, does someone something else pointed out? Um, okay, so we have 2u squared. Now this one that survives. And uh, what does the rest condense do? Um, no. Watch your signs. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so they all combine together. Two thirds plus two thirds plus two thirds is yeah. Um, two v squared is equal to two. 
So the new region is defined by the equation u squared plus u squared equals 1. So sure enough, we're transforming from this ellipse to the unit circle in um, uv space. Um, now, how did, how did you do that? Because one of them's a u squared, and then two of them are v squared. Um, OK, oh, that's a v. Sorry. Sometimes my v's and u's look alike. OK. Um, all right. So, uh, so it turns out, actually, we're not going to integrate with respect to u and v after all, because what should we do with this integral over a circle? How should we actually handle that? Um, Find the area. Uh, well, this isn't this isn't an area problem, but how do we? What's the easiest way to handle integral over a circle? What should we? Instead of polar coordinates, yeah. So instead of integrating respect to u and v, but let's get everything in terms of u and v first, and then we'll deal with the polar coordinates, because then basically we're back to what we did a few sections ago. Um, okay. Um, so so question number one. It's essentially been answered. We know what region we're uh, integrating over, the unit circle. Um, and if we did need limits in u and v, we'd know what they would be. It'd be like from minus 1 to 1 in u, and then like square plus or minus square root of 1 minus u squared for v. But we're not actually going to do that. Um, now, we also know, uh, OK, so our original integral over r. So here's our ellipse, whatever it looks like in x, y space transforms into, and I'll just call it d for disk, uh, u, u squared plus v squared equals 1. So our original integral, x squared minus xy plus y squared dA, is now an integral over the unit disk, d. And um, the integrand, uh, we know how to transform that because we just worked it out earlier. So that's going to be 2u squared plus 2v squared. Um, and then we still need our Jacobian of x and y with respect to u and v. We don't want to forget that. Um, so, um, so the integrand has been changed. We just need to deal with this. Don't forget the absolute value. So the Jacobian of x and y with respect to u and v, so the formula for that is um, du d sorry, dx du, dy dv, notice this is with respect to opposite variables, and then you have a minus, and then you switch everything around. dx dv, dy du. Now, fortunately, all of those derivatives are going to be constant. So like dx du is square root of 2. dy dv is square root of 2 thirds, and then dx dv is minus square root of 2 thirds. dy du is square root of 2. So everything um, ends up adding together. So we get uh, 2 square root of 2 square root of 2 thirds um, is our uh, Jacobian. So at least that's, that's a constant. So we have uh, 4 over the square root of 3. Um, so that's what goes in here. So now if I pull out whatever constants I can, I'm going to have 8 over the square root of 3, because I have this 2 also that I can pull out. Um, integral over the disk, u squared plus v squared dA. So that's um, as far as we can get before we do anything involving polar coordinates. So, um, so questions about what happened to get it to this point. So same task every time. Figure out what your new region is. Um, change the integrand by replacing x and y with your new variables. And then figure out what your Jacobian is. That's your extra factor. Now, yes? How did you, how did you get the, the partial derivative of x with respect to u? Um, oh, oh, so oh uh, going back to here. Just differentiating these. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's why 
you need your old variables equaling functions of your new variables so that you can go ahead and get those partial derivatives. Okay. Um, now we can do polar coordinates. So that 8 over square root of 3 is still there. And now it's just integral from 0 to 2 pi in theta, 0 to 1 in r. u squared plus v squared is r squared. So now your new change of variable is u and v are equal to r cosine theta and r sine theta, respectively. Um, so this is your integrand, and then you still have its Jacobian, which is just the r that you're accustomed to putting in there for uh, polar coordinates. Um, you just don't have to go through all this. We know what it is. Um, and then you can go ahead and finish working that out um, from there. And from this point, it's worked out in the notes. On page 102, Final answer of 4 pi over square root of 3. Good idea to try whether it's now or later. You're working this out from this point and making sure you actually get that. How do you find the second term? Oh, um, well, if you didn't already know what it was supposed to be r, you could do the same thing here if you did over here. So your Jacobian of um, these new variables. Um, well, actually, your, your old variables, u and v, with respect to the new new variables, r and theta, would be du dr dv d theta minus dv dr du d theta. Um, and actually, um, I worked out this similar thing last time, where you just take these partial derivatives and plug them in here, and through cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, ends up simplifying to R. Okay, so be that's just to know that. Especially in a test, yes. Um, yeah, like for polar cylindrical using R, and then for spherical using um, real squared sine theta. So in polar coordinates, you always have to add that extra R in there. Right, because that's the Jacobian for, for that change of coordinates. Doc points for many people. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, I have one more example, and then we'll have time for some some more questions. Um, so for this example, um, we have double integral over region R, x, no, x plus y, e to the x squared minus y squared, and R is a rectangle. Um, and it's bounded by these lines, um, x minus y equals 0, x minus y is equal to 2, x plus y is 0, x plus y is equal to 3. Um, when you have something like this, the region defined this way, um, I, like the last time we had a parallelogram defined using equations of this sort, um, where these, so we have two parallel edges here, and then two parallel edges here. Um, that basically tells you what your new variables um, should be. So if I were to draw this, so x, so y equals x defines one edge. y equals minus x. So y equals x. Well, actually, I'll write it the same way. x minus y equals 0. This is x plus y is 0. Then I have. Uh, this line, uh, y is equal to um, 
x minus 2. Okay. Now I regret my choice of scaling, but um, okay. So this is x minus y is uh, equal to 2. And then we have uh, x plus y is equal to 3. So to draw that, I can just plug in x equals 0 and get my y-intercept, um, which is 3. And then x plus y equals 3. That is a line at the slope of minus 1. OK, this is x plus y is equal to 3. So it's this region in here, my region r, that I need to integrate this uh, over. OK. Um, so in this case, the change of variable is not explicitly given, but what you can do is use your equations to infer what it should be. It's, it's similar to a problem in a practice step. Um, so I go ahead and let u equal x plus y. Uh, so therefore, u is between 0 and 3. v is x minus y. So I'm using the left side for these equations. So v is between 0 and 2. Now, I could have chosen this either way. I could have chosen u to be this and v to be this. That in itself doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Um, so which is u, which is v, I just made that choice arbitrarily. Um, so now we have constant limits in uh, u and v. So, uh, so like the first question I wrote before, um, what should the limits be? We have that now. So 0 to 3 in u, 0 to 2 in v. Um, and then we need to transform the integrandle. x plus y, that is u. Um, and so I'll fill that in here. We need our Jacobian. Don't, don't forget that. We'll deal with that momentarily. Now, x squared minus y squared. Um, we do not currently have x and y expressed in terms of u and v. It's the other way around. But if you, think, if you know your algebra, um, you can tell me quickly what is that supposed to be in terms of u and v. Square root of v? No. So you can see how x squared minus y squared relates to other expressions written on this board. Yes, because x squared minus y squared is equal to x plus y, x minus y, and that's u oh, v. Okay. Um, so now we have that, e to the u v. Okay, so everything is ready except for the Jacobian. Fortunately, the Jacobian is going to turn out to be a constant in this case, because once again, u uh, and v depend linearly on x and y. Um, now... Um, okay. There are two ways I can sh show you how to do this, um, and you can use whichever way you prefer. Um, so, so, first method is you can, and it's probably what I would do most of the time, is solve for x and y uh, in terms of u and v. Um, so you'd have to do elimination and substitution on these equations. Um, now, uh, so for instance, I could say that x is equal to u minus y from the first equation for u, and then I can substitute that into the equation for v. So v is equal to u minus y minus y. Um, so it's u minus 2y. So now I can, I've eliminated x, and I can solve for um, y. So if I take this equation and solve it for uh, y, um, what am I going to get?
with the alphabet. Specifics I hate to have my expressions, I try to avoid them at all costs. Fractions and minuses. <laughs> but yeah, you were right. Um, okay, and now you can substitute that back in here. Um, and what will happen is uh, x is equal to u plus v over 2. So now you have your old variables in terms of your new, and then you can go ahead and do the Jacobian. So, um, Go to x and y with respect to u and v is let's use a shorthand that we've seen for partial derivatives. X u y v minus y u x v. So all of these are going to be plus or minus a half. So we have one half dy dv is minus a half, and then we have minus y u which is one half, and then x v is one half. So we get minus a half, minus a half. Um, so, well, sorry, minus a fourth, four, minus a fourth equals minus a half. But don't forget, um, actually, I forgot this here. We have to have the absolute value. Your Jacobian is always positive. Um, so now we're going to, so your Jacobian is going to be one half. So that's one way that you can do the Jacobian. Um, and depending on the equation you're given, you know, that might be kind of tedious. Um, now, for those of you who have a little more understanding of uh, linear algebra, I can suggest uh, an alternative that I think definitely would have been easier in this case. Now, as you see in these examples, your Jacobian is supposed to be partial derivatives of your old variables with respect to your new. So you need to remember that. Um, but that requires having your old variables expressed in terms of your new variables, which we were not given initially. Or if you really want to go the other way, it's more convenient partial of your old, your new variables with respect to your old variables, that's fine too as long as you invert it. Um, so, uh, and also, whatever you do, because the thing is, this is going to be partial derivatives of, in this case, u and v with respect to x and y. Um, now, in, uh, we still need something in terms of u and v. Um, but, if you know it's going to be a constant anyway, which is what happens in this case, uh, u and v are related linearly to x and y, um, then this is perfectly easy to do. So that would be going the other way, um, u x v y minus v x u y. And those are all going to be plus or minus 1. Um, so du dx is 1 dv dy is minus 1, vx is 1, and uy is 1. So we get minus 2, and don't forget you have to take 1 over that, so you get, sure enough, minus a half. And you take the absolute value, um, and you uh, go from there. So, um, so in this case, it wasn't absolute, absolutely necessary to express x and y in terms of u and v. So in, especially in simple cases like this, you can work it out the other way as long as you take a reciprocal in the end. Um, OK, so I don't care what you do. Um, all right, now, finally for the integral, we have uh, 0 to 3 in u, 0 to 2 in v, and we have, uh, well, 1 half that comes out front. And then we have u e to the u v d v d u. OK. Um, now, here, we, integral of e to the, I'm doing my time here. OK. 
integral of e to the v would just be e to the v. But now it's e to the uv, where u is treated as a constant. Now, the u I can pull out to here. So now I have, um, actually if I do it this way, with limits 0 and 2 du. So what is the, what's this part that I boxed in? What is the antiderivative of that with respect to v? Not quite. A more concrete example would be, that would be familiar from elsewhere. Because if I like e to the 2x, what's the derivative? 2e to 2x. All right. So that's derivative. What is the integral of e to the 2x? What do you do in that case? Yeah, you divide by the coefficient of x. Anytime you have a function of a constant times x, exponential sine, cosine, if you know how to integrate it, go ahead and integrate it and divide by the coefficient of x. I drill that so deep into my Cal 2 students' heads, they'll never get rid of it. Um, I guess I have to do it with you guys, too. So here, you're integrating with respect to v. So what are you dividing by? Mm -hmm. u. So we have e to the uv, that's undisturbed, divided by u, which, of course, is quite convenient, because then the u's are going to cancel out. Imagine that. Um, and now you can. Um, plug in the limits from here for, you just integrate with respect to v, so you plug in the limits for v, and you get e to the 2u minus 1 du, um, and then you can uh, work that out from there, um, and get a final answer of 1 fourth e to the 6 minus 7. Um, yeah, very common mistake on these kind of integrals where you have a function of a constant times your variable, always divide by that constant. Um, but in the function itself, don't disturb it. It's still, it, you start with e to the 2x, you're still going to have an e to the 2x. So any questions about, especially the setup, that's the thing that's really new here. Homework and or practice test questions. Okay. Um, I assume this is for one and two today. Okay. Problem. What's which problem? What problem? Twelve. Okay. Ah, the last one. Ah. Oh, throw in a little probability. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, this problem? Or? Not this one, but I think it was number nine. It had like 18 or 13 different molecules. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll have to admit that when I picked these problems two years ago, um, I was only looking at okay, what's the main thing you're asking about, not how many parts it had. Sorry. <laughs> and for a lot of these problems, they have some data about like what is the average length of time that it takes students to work them out. But um, okay, all right. So I guess this one only has three parts altogether. Okay, so um, all right. So, so so what are you doing here? Because everything is in. Um, terms of minutes, so your prob okay, so probability you're looking for is the integral from 0 to t of lambda 1 e to the minus lambda 1 t dt. That's strange. It's not even a multiple integral. I'm not sure what they were thinking there, but okay. Um, okay, and lambda 1, okay, lambda 1 is given to be 0 0.4 per minute, so we can fill that in. Um, 
and then the other thing they give you, the, the, the numbers in my case, find the probability that a phone call arrives during the first 48 seconds, which is 0 0.8 minutes. Um, so in this case, with the probability of, uh, zero, okay, so that's 0 0.8 is what you would fill in um, for your limit. Um, now, or was it a later part of this problem that you? It was actually this part. I mean, I, it seemed easy, but I just didn't get it right. I don't know if I was rounding wrong or what. Um, yeah, something to be careful about just because of, uh, does it want four decimal places? Mm -hmm. um, okay. In theory, it, it seems simple. Uh, so you don't, do you put 0.8 in for that T as well? Um, oh, not, not yet. Uh, oh, you mean this T? Yeah. No. Uh, because what happens is now you have to integrate that. So you're going to have 0 0.4 e to the minus 0 0.4 t over minus 0 0.4 um, with limits 0 and 0 0.8. And, okay, at least the 0.4s cancel, but leaving the minus. So that's going to give you, uh, when you plug in t equals 0, you're going to get 1 minus e to the minus 0 0.4 times 0 0.8. And you have to be careful with your, uh, your signs um, here. Um, now, because so, in some cases, if it asks for four decimal places, you don't necessarily want to have four decimal places throughout your computation. You need to have a little more than that uh, to make sure that your ending answer is, uh, is still correct to um, four decimal places, especially with dealing with exponentials where you might get pretty small numbers. Um, so I have point three, minus point three two. Um, okay. Yeah, um, Sorry, what? I got point two seven three nine. Um, yeah, to four decimal places. Um, mm. Um, and uh, yeah, because like in this case, like the answer that I got from my uh, calculator was 0.27385. So it just barely rounds up to 0.2739, which I just put it in and accepted. Um, so all it takes is one case of rounding too much. Um, now, um, I can work a lot of this out on, on paper beforehand, or uh, I like, um, I would actually, whatever decimal places, however many they ask for, I'd go up at least double that in your intermediate stages. And then you just play it safe. Because I had a case in my, I teach Math 102, Math 102 online, where um, uh, someone actually got the right answer, but because of rounding, um, it was like just barely off. And I had to go in and override it. It's it's kind of a pain. Um, now, were there any other questions about that problem, or? I mean, I, I guess it would be something I'd mess up from because I challenged that it up. Okay. Yeah, because what happens in part B is now it moves to a double integral. So now this problem makes sense to put in this class. But it's something where you have lambda one and lambda two, and you can actually separate it into product of two integrals like this one, uh, because you can pull out constants and things like that. Um, Okay. Well, was it another, another homework problem or, or practice test problem? Go over number three on the practice test. Okay. Um, oh, and actually, I had the problem pulled up here. Um, oh, I thought I did anyway. Where'd it go? Um, okay. Um, number three on the practice. And as we get closer to the test, we're going to look more at the practice uh, test anyway. Um, okay. So you have a double integral. Okay, so your integrand is x, and your region, okay, this is a polar coordinates problem, um, and your uh, region d is a circle. r is equal to 4 sine theta, which seems strange. Um, but here's how it works. You start with theta equals 0, and you ask, what is r? Well, r is going to be 0 starting out. 
So you're at the origin. And then um, as theta increases, well, sine theta is going to increase, until you get to a point where theta is equal to pi over 2, where sine theta is 1, and then your r is going to be 4. So, so, theta, so r is increasing as theta increases. But then once theta moves past pi over 2, sine is going to decrease. So r is going to decrease as well. Until theta becomes pi, so you get all the way over here, and r is going to be 0 again. Okay. Um, so um, now one thing you can do is uh, to see why, another way to see why it's a circle, multiply both sides by r. So then you have r squared is 4r sine theta, but r squared is x squared plus y squared, and 4r sine theta is, is what? We switch back to x and y. Yeah, 4y. So now, you can write this as x squared plus y squared minus 4y equals 0. So then I can complete the square, add 4 to both sides. And you get x squared plus y minus 2 quantity squared is equal to 2 squared. So this is a circle with center x is 0, y is 2, and radius 2. Um, so this is one way from a equation like this. Uh, it could be r equals something sine theta or r equals something cosine theta, which puts your circle over here. Um, and you can see what uh, kind of shape you're dealing with. OK. Um, now, um, so I've made a common solution. Because you circle back around to the origin when, from, when theta goes from 0 to pi, that's your q that you're only in quadrants 1 and 2. So your theta values will go from 0 to pi. So that's what your limits will be in that case. Now what about your limits? Okay, your integrand will be r cosine theta, that's x, times r. So the last thing to settle is, what are the limits in r? Well, you, as, as theta sweeps from 0 to pi, you start from the origin, and you keep going until you hit the circle. So that's going to be um, 0 to 4 sine theta. So that's how you get your limits um, for this integral. How does it go from 0 to pi and not to pi? Um, because it doesn't there's no part of a circle down here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's why it's a good idea. Like, um, If you see where, for a problem like this, see where r is equal to 0. Uh, or like, um, even if it's not feasible to try to like you know, draw this because for a given value of theta, like how do you gauge how far out is four sine theta? Um, that's why I actually put the problem, it's a circle. So at least you know you have that. Uh, but what kind of circle? And that's why I throw this out here too. This would be a way to figure out what you're dealing with. Um, so for instance, if it would be the other way around, four cosine theta, your circle would be over here and your theta limits would be like uh, minus pi over two to pi over two. Um, and then when you um, uh, keep going with the integral, you have 0 to pi cosine theta, 0 to 4 sine theta, r squared. And then when you work out that integral, um, I don't feel like going to another board. So you're going to get um, okay. So you're going to get uh, r cubed over three from zero to four sine theta dr um, d theta rather, and plug in those limits, and you're going to get sixty four over three that you can pull out. And then you're going to have uh, sine cubed theta, d theta. And the way you handle this is uh, substitution. Let u be equal to sine theta. Du is cosine theta, d theta. Um, and then you can integrate um, u cubed du. 
um, and work it out from there. Although the answer turns out to be zero in this case. <coughs> okay. Um, and uh, you can look at the solution for the remainder of the details. But, okay. Um, if anyone has any other homework questions, you can stick around. Um, also, um, if you, Assignment to today, there's another assignment coming up next. I will have some time on Friday for homework questions, too. Oh, you were 